A warm welcome to everyone for our PC Quest 35 years journey from 1987 to 2022. Today we will be discussing how PCs have been used as a political tool. For that we have with us Arvind Gupta, co-founder and head Digital India Foundation. Welcome Arvind. Thank you for having me Sunil. so i'll i'll get straight to it you know as the topic is clear how pcs have been used as a political tool maybe you can just uh, begin on you know what effect pcs had on parties campaigns elections what effect they had on governance and what effect they had on communication with the citizen maybe we can take it from there thank you sunil and um, it's a privilege to talk to you on your 35th uh, anniversary as your name itself has suggested right pc quest move to uh, you also have data quest i think your question really underlying is that um whether uh, how pcs as a proxy for technology has been used over the years when pcs just stood for pc itself but then uh, you know um then it of course became more data and digital and overall the theme has been technology and whether it's been used only in politics or overall in our democracy in our governance and that has changed over the years you know mid 80s i think 87 is when you got um, founded um when the pc was just being introduced globally not only in india but being globally being introduced there was a lot of apprehension that uh, that this is this is the tool which is of course there for productivity but it's going to cut jobs in a country like india where we we've, we've always had jobs as an issue uh it became a very very big political point whether you know computerization is going to help us do a jobless growth but i think over the years at least in a country like india in a society like india it's shown that technology has nothing but always given productivity enhancements has added to jobs has created a better society and you know 35 years from 87 to today is a long time in the more cycle probably we have completed about 18 more cycles so 2 to the power 18 is trillions and trillions of uh, you know um of uh, of cycles that we have gone through so that's a very very uh, very very long uh, long uh, long cycle now um, uh, in, in the context of how uh, it has evolved you have to see that earlier and and i'll talk about four or five aspects aspects of democracy which is you know and which is as i said the large political economy in the sense that what is elections it's a circular thing but i'll start with elections pre elections which is parties and their own uh, you know communication mechanisms elections and social media uh, the, the conduct of elections the communication during elections and lastly then post elections then the governance which is then the party who wins any elections comes into power and delivers on that so and and that has two parts delivery of service delivery using technology and then communication again so to deliver keep a constant touch and this is where i have worn various hats and i can share with you my experiences now see the if you take from the period of let's say 90s just to simplify it whereas the internet was really becoming internet as we know it today in till about 2000 in the silicon valleys india also had a little bit twist with the uh, with the internet in about 2000 the famous dot coms that started but really we became um in uh, you know uh, a, a internet thought processor only after 2012 13 when we had substantial users in 2014 when we conducted the general elections uh india had give or take about um, uh, 12 crore internet users today in 2022 we have 80 crores so that's like a 6 six, six and a half times 7x if you can broadly say it jump in the last 8 years so uh, and that's expected as i said from a, from purely from a technology uh, uh, perspective from a more slow perspective that's that's how that, that's the that growth is expected um so you know we've come a long way from from the world uh, you know just adopting computers in the 90s and the internets and really in the 2000s india probably lagged in the adoption and we skipped i think um, the the really the pc revolution that happened globally but we skipped and we came straight away to a smartphone revolution and today india has you know of the 80 crore users there is 80 crore smartphones plus or minus a little bit so it's it's a pretty much we are a smartphone country and um, and in that digital first mobile first uh, country how we have evolved is something that i'll i'll talk about so 
you know, uh, as I said, the base of your question, the PC as a proxy for technology data has been there in the political process, really um, uh, starting with the political process and then the campaigns and the governance. Political process, it has been there, but you know, in a, in a very loose sense, data was used a lot. So people used to use PCs in, to do a little bit of number crunching. It was not so pervasive beyond that. Uh, parties and um, had websites and you know some emails would go out for a little databases that had emails and that it was kind of limited to that when 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 leaders launched their own website or blogs that was considered frontline and mainline news and and when even the current prime minister came on the social media as we know it today in 2000 um, 2010 and 11 time frame um, it was big time big time news because he was a leader in that nobody had started using um, in the 11, 12 framework, Facebook, Twitter, and, and he is one of the most pro prolific and most followed leaders today. But that was the early days and people actually used to make comments that uh, too much tweeting will lead to quitting. So, you know, there was, there was, a, there was a complete, uh, a, you know, dichotomy. And I'm not saying that dichotomy is unfounded because people didn't experience that the power of technology to its fullest. So political parties, uh, were using it and 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 then diverse um, political parties to it in a diverse manner were using it you know probably for their internal accounting processes a little bit um, uh, maintaining their own party workers databases uh, come election time would probably using it for uh, doing voter analysis some statistical analysis and that was how it was limited till about I would say 2011 uh, 12 the elections process was really a process where the election commission was using um you know not really pc but the you know the evm which is which is a which is the electronic device but really a you know, unconnected electronic device uh, in a standalone devices and we've had this evm since um, the early 2000s and the evms have really revolutionized our um, election processes but we have come a huge way and I'll, that's why i want to shift uh, to the post-2014 um, period, but 2014 or 14 period where everything shifted different gears. So till 2012, 13, you can say in the election process, uh, the party processes, computerization or use of uh, very, very, very primitive. Um, and this is about till 12, 13. And same thing, elections were primarily driven by uh, the EVM process. Still a lot of, uh, you know, the communication used to be more on uh, a little bit on uh, text messaging, but a lot more on uh, on newspaper advertising, TV, and and uh, outdoors, and that's what was you know the was the backbone of both the election uh, electioneering process as well as the election process. And the third um, phase of governance. In governance, as you know, we the Aadhaar project really started around um, around 2010-11, and um, and nobody actually could visualize what would be the impact of this new thing that we're doing because India was such a, at uh, that time, again, a very diverse thing. Of the 1.2 billion people, you know, maybe 300, 400 people, million people in India, which is 30 crores out of 120 crores had some form of ID. And the rest 80, 90 crores had no form of ID. So there was a there was not even a paper ID that was there with people, individuals. And may, there was, there was, this was a known study that of the 100 rupees that left the government coffers, only 15 reached the end user because everything was lost in translation in fakes and duplicate and ghosts. So our governance really didn't actually have any technology intervention. And that was where the highest amount of leakage and disservice to a democracy was happening because, you know, there was umpteen uh, uh, leakage, there was, uh, you know, wastage of uh, government money. And, and at the end of it, the promise of democracy was not getting fulfilled because the service delivery was not happening very well. And all this changed, and uh, rightly so, when the advent of the fourth industrial revolution really. In 2010 onwards, the fourth industrial revolution was becoming a concept globally. India was becoming a, you know, 13, 14 onwards, we were becoming an economy with a new political leadership. And this leadership had come uh, into power uh, Prime Minister Modi had come into power with a lot of um, promise of technology, with the promise of um, digital India, with the promise of creating a new, you know, um, using technology to empower, uh, to, to make sure that service delivery empowerment is delivered to the last mile. The highest usage of in the world ever in the social media, 
using social media for campaigning, which produced a distinct advantage for the prime minister was in the 2014 election because it was such a big disruption. The use of data analytics was such a big disruption. The use of, um, you know, um, uh, outreach based on technology, 3D and everything else was the biggest thing that you could see as a pivotal moment and everybody understood the benefits of using this there on. So nobody talks about now that whether you need to use uh, technology, including social media and others post 2014, it was established. And that is where I think our democracy really became digital. Along with it came a host of other problems. I mean, you know, and we'll talk about post 2015, 16, this whole problem of misinformation, fake news. And the election commission also was really taking cognizance in the election rig process also. You could see that, you know, we, they, were, they were becoming active on social media. They were understanding the impact of social media. The new guidelines had to be made for social media. So both the party processes and then the election process, as I said, started adopting technology. The parties to a much larger extent, the election commission got to, un uh, to understand the impact of it a little later during the elections. And that became an issue. I mean, whether people can tweet, not tweet, because there's a campaigning ban sometimes, right? But Twitter is always open. There is borderless internet, right? So how do you, what, what can you do and not do? What kind of things are allowed and not allowed? So those become very, very um, new things for the election commission. And I think they, they stepped up to the challenge and, and fixed it. But the real change happened 2014 in the governance cycle when uh, uh, the team led by Prime Minister Modi really came about and set up a lot of things. You know, 2014 itself, I was CEO of MyGov. 2014, MyGov was set up, which was a citizen to, um, you know, government to citizen communication platform. Uh, this whole platformization of Aadhaar started. Um, you know, 2014 onwards, you had Aadhaar really becoming um, a massive tool for governance. And, you know, basically it was a top-down, uh, policy decision that we need to adopt Aadhaar and we need to make it not just a tool for identity, but a, a political um, uh, tool, a political economy tool, which is embedded into all our systems so that delivery of, um, of services can be really enhanced. And so the whole DBT direct benefits transfers, linking it with the Jam Trinity, the Jandan Aadhaar mobile uh, Trinity, and then taking it forward from there in, in, in a way that it has never been done in a country like India. And, and ensuring that 100 rupees that leaves the government coffers reaches the 100 rupees, so all the goes, fakes. You know, um, uh, Sunil, you would be surprised. During the first four or five years of adoption of technology in the governance process, and I can go on and, on and talk about it, is that uh, we discovered about six to seven crore fakes, people who didn't exist in India, were taking government benefits. So that's how the amount of impact it has had on government. And so if you see the full circle, the pre-elections, the, the, the political process, the democratic process of elections and campaigning, and then the post-democratic process of governance, delivery of that, I think today this technology is so integrated in all these three things. So it's come a long way from the journey that started with, uh, with disdain and job, jobs getting destroyed when the computerization started, uh, computer reservation started for railways or for Indian airlines at that time, I think there was there were protests. I remember, and we were we were young kids then. But today, it's mainstream. Everybody understands it. Everybody gets their SMS and uh, benefits on a phone, and they know how to transact using a phone. And it's, it's really completely transformed. And um, and you know, today a vaccine certificate is available on a WhatsApp uh, in a country like India. So we have really leapfrogged from that. Um, skipping the PC revolution per se, the desktop revolution, I must say, from, you know, we really had a few mainframes and, um, and then we really skipped the desktop revolution and we straight away came to a smartphone, um, the cloud, uh, the smack revolution, which is social, mobile, analytics, and the cloud. And that, that is what uh, India has done over the last 10 years. So there is, um, in my, my um, 35 years of your um, a journey, I think I would split it into two parts. The first 25 years, which is still about 2012, and then suddenly 2012 to 22, which is the last 10 years, which has this proliferation of um, fourth industrial revolution tools, S and the smack thing, the social media, um, uh, mobile, uh, analytics, and, and of course, cloud. And this has become, uh, this is, these are the new terminology in all these three processes, aided with India's new innovative approach of 
building digital public infrastructure. So Sunil, one thing we also have to recognize, India is the only country in the world which has built um, uh, public digital infrastructure to be used by, by all the elements of the country, which is government, society, businesses, and, um, and startups. And this has completely revolutionized our, not only just the governance process, as I said, we've done some, you know, um, um, 300, 400 billion dollars worth of direct benefits transfers over the so many years, but out of, the, out of that 300 billion dollars, I think more than 25 billion dollars has been saved in identifying those goals and, um, and, uh, and misplaced uh, beneficiaries. So I think um, what we have achieved at the end, and then the scale, I mean, when we had the pandemic hit us in 2020, and there was a lot of job loss and, and uncertainty, um, over two, two days, uh, you know, there was this direct benefits uh, that were being transferred to every family in India, who are deserving family in India, eligible family in India, to make sure that they, they, don't, um, they don't have uh, starvation, they, don't, they get money, basic sustenance money to live. Unlike many countries in the world, which, which had queues of, for food coupons outside their offices and the stores. So this is a very transformative uh, change that has happened. And this is sometimes a benefit, both of technology, leadership, and I think um, the leapfrogging uh, that, that we have done. So three things I think came together, right? Leadership and governance mindset, the vision of that. Two, technology was ready. And three, um, the whole fact that we could leapfrog and we were not bun uh, burdened by, you know, suddenly uh, obsolete computers or obsolete technology or instruments, I think helped India a lot. So um, it became very affordable. I mean, where in India in, uh, today, you can see somebody uh, consume almost 45, 50 GB of data at about 200 rupees a month, right? I mean, uh, on a smartphone, they watch, I mean, people watch whole set of movies and everything is mobile first. I mean, and you and me know it, we are not those data consumers. Our average data consumption today is about 16 GB as an average, as a nation. That's, that's one of the highest in the world, number one, actually. At the lowest data cost in the world, we are less than, you know, six rupees uh, a GB a month uh, for data. So you know, so that's a, that's a, that's that's the story of uh, evolution that we have had from that unaffordable PC or that unaffordable uh, or that huge um, unaffordable internet. And this is not only India; this has been global. But we just compress the time so fast, and um, and that is aided by, as I said the right, right leadership, but also right policies that the leadership has uh, made sure that it's a trickle down, the right trickle down effect, um, technology available at the right time, and including the digital public infrastructure that India has built, and this whole, uh, whole concept of leapfrogging. Um, what are the problems that we've seen over the last this 10 years, especially the last four or five years, um, um, has been this whole, the whole battle in the world is now around three, four areas. Misuse of data and using that data for, for organized operations or whatever you may call it. So this whole psych operations or international digital operations, what we saw in the UK and maybe in the US, um, influence operations. So that, there's, there's a big, big issue. And we saw platforms becoming really big without governance, that's the second issue. With no governance, all these big digital platforms from China, India banned of, um, most of the Chinese platforms in 2020. But China, the big platforms were coming primarily from China and the US, but really no governance. There was one of the biggest used platforms in India, didn't even have an India office or India head. So there, there were issues, there are issues, and these issues are ongoing. This whole issue about privacy and transparency, the issue of platforms and their governance, the issue of use of data, who really owns it, how can it be used, what can be done about it. And then along with it, this whole, this whole battle, the constant, the biggest battle that we have today is the fake news and misinformation battle. So uh, along with it has come new problems. There is problems of ethics, this whole ethics of technology, trust in technology. So the, it's a new set of problems. We didn't have these problems 10 years ago, or we never thought about these problems. I mean, you had a PC, you opened the PC, you did your things, you went away. Today you're worried that you know, whether you have your location on on the phone or whether some app is eating your data and sharing it with, uh, with people that shouldn't be. Cyber fraud has increased a lot. Financial fraud has increased a lot, uh, a, a lot using technology. So I think um, 
you know, the earlier frauds you used to hear is somebody hacking into the um, uh, Chris uh, railway reservation system and booking those tickets in 10 minutes, which would have taken hours to book, but people hacked that. And that was a big deal. But today it's mostly financial crime. Uh, There's new, um, new sorts of challenges. And, um, uh, and India is doing a very good job of balancing between you know, new policy, innovation, and, uh, and, and this whole considerations of uh, privacy, um, uh, new tech, and, and as, as, as it's coming along. So um, those are my, um, you know, to, to your uh, one question, I think I just tried to give my aspect of uh, my uh, journey that over the last uh, 35 years, how I would break it. So, uh, that's quite fascinating. So I like that, uh, you know, 20, 25 years, first you said 25 years, we are on a trajectory, then the disruption happened in the last 10 years. So actually, I would be curious to know, since that has been summed uh, uh, properly. So what about where are we heading? What about the future? Because one is like you said that in 2012, the disruption happened, our current prime minister had it, but then everybody has adopted that that strategy and we are entering a you know phase of the entire so if you if it's possible what is where are we heading in the next 10 years well, that's a great same thing. Yeah. question right i mean i'm not one of those uh, four years uh, of technology that can see what will happen 10 years from now yeah. you know because anybody who's uh, dared to forecast 10 years from now has gone wrong whether it's the mighty bill gates to uh, to uh, uh, tj watson to anybody right i mean it's this is an area that it's very difficult um, to 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 imagine what will happen four or five years from now, um, you know. Uh, but I will risk out the next four years. That's what I think. The next four or five years. What is that we think should happen? What are the issues that we think we should address? Uh, I think all the problems. First of all, let's see the fake news, the misinformation. How do we make sure that's number one problem globally, not only in India. Two, how do we make the more trust in technology? And that along with that will come this whole. Uh, global adoption of standards on public platforms. India is already leading that, right? I mean, we are, we have this whole India stack, the Aadhaar stack, which is, you know, payments, UPI, uh, payments led by UPI, uh, identity led by Aadhaar, the paperless led by DigiLocker, all working together. We've created this platform. We've created the health stack. We are creating the e-commerce stack. We are creating the um, voice stack. We are creating the skills stack. So India is stackifying many things. And while we are doing that, I think there has to be a global um, agreement that this may be the way to go to build more trust in technology, more and, and, and more governance. The other aspect that people overlook is because of the democratic norms of India, we get we have more governance. I mean, how many questions have been asked um, about Aadhaar? And it is passed the, uh, till the highest court of the law in Supreme Court. A lot of things were done, a lot of things were not implemented, maybe 90% was done, 10% was not implemented. But finally, that's democracy all about, right? You have issues, you can take it. If I have issues with Facebook, I, or if I have use, issues with any other platform, I won't name one of them. I have very little recourse, right? I mean, if, if, we, if we as a country, as societies, as democracies, there is there will be a need for more digital public infrastructure. I think that's one thing I see India leading internally. And that is the, also goes with the theme of the prime minister, solve for India, sell to the world. So that's one area I see a lot of things happen. Two, as I already said, this whole area of how do we address the whole challenges of blockchain and um, uh, fake news, uh, misinformation, sorry, not blockchain, fake, in, fake news and misinformation. And three, when it comes to new technologies like blockchain, um, automated driving, right? Driverless cars, um, AI, AI that becomes a GPT kind of a tool, general purpose technology, how will, how will it, how will it change society? And in that, how do we make sure that the ethics, the, uh, the diversity, uh, you know, is codified in it, the policies are codified in that. That will be the third area. Fourth area and fifth area will be a lot of supply chain, digital supply chain control. I think you will see a lot of gated uh, uh, innovation in the sense that with COVID, now I'm talking about with COVID because I used to say beyond COVID, I don't know when beyond COVID is going to happen. So with COVID, we'll have to understand there'll be a lot of disruption. So a lot of gated innovation means people will do as, you know, if you were doing 30% ourselves and 70% was spread globally, I think you'll see that number becoming 50-50. So a lot of things will become internal. You will start having more trust 
in a small supply chain ecosystem it won't be you know because again standards are evolving but those standards are not being adhered to by by you know in in, in the absence of a, a resilient supply chain so there will be um, there will be a lot of gated innovation and lastly i think uh, wearables devices um iot um will become even more pervasive I'm, and and india again is you know for example with drone the travel uh, the drone the, the digital side platform that we are building things like that you will see new economies leapfrogging india leading the way that you know we the countries will have to understand that there is no need to wait for 10 years or 20 years for for this this leapfrog to happen you can do leapfrogging in 3 to 4 years 2 to 3 years right so um i think those are the trends i'm seeing with india leading that uh with india uh, really setting up new standards for governments and uh, and uh, and you know uh, i think uh, one thing that definitely covid has shown that when when re revenue becomes shrink and you have limited revenue you need to make sure that 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 dollar amount that rupee amount is spent more judiciously and that's where technology will help a lot it's already helping india and it will help again other countries in the world i think this whole mantra of startups um, you know a, a unicorn a week um, by the ministers and by our, by the government will will really come true, and as and as new 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 technology stacks are becoming public infrastructure, each of them will produce hundred unicorns. That's a bold prediction I'm trying to make. I mean the the fintech platform produce hundred uh, are almost producing about hundred uh, unicorns in about in about you know five years. I think that compression will happen where you will get fifty unicorns a year um uh, from from this uh, from next year onwards again uh, th thanks for making those bold predictions so i just like to end with you know one thing so one thing like from 80s we have always been hearing india is like a tiger it'll do this it'll do that but if you see like as you have said technology has been a great disruptor and i would like to say first it disrupted the political system and then governance and also technology is a level playing field so and uh, last 10 years we have done so many schemes so as in are you positive that probably india can on the basis of technology we can finally get there we can be a superpower we can be number one so are you hopeful of this disruption going forward and what would be your final outcome do you think i'm, I'm to, to sunil see there are many things i mean you know today if you see with our uh, with our um, democracy with our demography with our digital outreach the deeds that we have I think um, India, no doubt, is is going to leapfrog. Is leapfrogging. We need to put the right leadership, consistent leadership, the right vision into place, and and that already is. The current leadership is absolutely aligned in this. This should not get disrupted. And as long as this keeps going on, I have a. I mean, I think uh, um, India will is already getting its right place in, uh, in the global world order, and it will continue to do that. Um, in fact, uh, you know. Uh, uh, technology will only aid its a speedier uh, repositioning into the global world order, uh, and and uh, you've seen that right now. I mean, um, just a small um, off the cuff remark I can make is that um, I get my uh, my vaccine certificate on a WhatsApp, which is backed by a public platform, open API platform called Coven, which we made, which is now available to the world. So you see the offering, it's just not the vaccines, the, the, the pharmaceutical and health side, it's the technology offering that the, the Indian, Indian establishment has made available to the world. The front end is WhatsApp, which is an American platform. So WhatsApp integrates into a, a coven facilitated by uh, Indian companies and uh, uh, my previous organization, MyGov. And you as a citizen get a certificate sitting at your home and without any fear that if I lose it, what happens? Now suddenly, this is where I think we are leaps and miles ahead of most of the countries in the world. Now, is this technology shareable? Yes, we want it to be shareable. Let other countries benefit from it. That's how the global, you know, society will benefit more. But where is it coming from? Bit size, zero cost, coming from India, right? So I think that is the world. And once you this happens, this becomes soft power for India. And that's where I think not only just the economic power. It's the soft power, the global power that we have, the powerhouse that we have. The fact that when the prime minister went to Silicon Valley in 2015 and said that not only Indians have you know mastered the the art of uh, you know uh, leading companies in Silicon Valley and 
and becoming CEOs there, but we are now making sure that India also is benefiting from this expertise that we have. And the brain bank that we have globally is also benefiting the India as a society and as a country. So I think we have an immense talent, immense technology, immense leadership, and um, all of this, when it comes together, it, it's, a, it's like any organization. You have the people, process, and technology. You'll always excel. I think India has the right ingredients to keep excelling. So, Anya, I'd like to thank you for giving that comprehensive you know, look at technology, political disruption in the last 35 years and looking beyond. And I like that. I think it's a good way to end on that optimistic and positive note that you said. Even I, I believe that India is there and it will go even more forward. Thank you. Thank you, Sunil.